The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. We are back. Comfortably zoned radio networks number one and number two mavens are here. And I am so glad. David Nemec first. You are recovering. And um, I'm so delighted that you're here. Me too. Really, really great to be back with you. Yeah, uh, serious auto accident. Uh, we won't get into it other than to say uh, we're blessed every day, all of us, that we're above ground, and uh, this illustrates it. Um, David, we're joined uh, by Alan Blumkin. Alan Blumkin, how are you? I'm hanging in there. Good. Uh, you surprised me with David being here today. Uh, David surprised me by accepting it. <laughs> okay. It's my first podcast um, in a while. I uh, haven't, and I, I had an, an idea based on something that uh, Alan said uh, earlier in the week on, on one of the baseball um, uh, groups on, on Facebook that we both subscribe to. We're talking about the St. Louis Browns. And um, everybody knows, if you're a baseball fan, you know the story of Eddie Goodell and um, and number, good old, as Alan calls them, good old number eighth. One eighth. Yeah. <laughs> One eighth. Yeah. Okay. Um, we know that story well, but I defy most baseball fans to give me a little bit of knowledge about the St. Louis Browns because they are um, one of the most underpopularized underpopular, uh, teams in history. And um, unfortunately, Bill Vec doesn't get enough play, and I'd like the two mavens on baseball on our network to discuss them any way they like, any way they think is appropriate, and uh, I'll learn, and the audience will learn, and that's what it's all about. So I'm going to start with you, Alan Blumkin. Uh, what happened, the, the, the germ of this, came when uh, I'm, we're in a group called uh, Baseball Six Sweet 16, which means baseball be- from 1901 through 1960 before the expansions. And uh, somebody uh, put up a picture of uh, one of my favorite brownies, Dick Kokos, K-O-K-O-S, uh, who I, obviously I remember from him from the cards he was on. And uh, it struck a nerve. And because uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 because I've been a member of the fan club for I don't know how long. There were a couple of others, the Boston Braves and the Philly A's, but they both folded up. The Browns are still going. And uh, I got the newsletter in the mail, news magazine, uh, the other day, and uh, they had a big article on the integration of the American League, the one the Browns integrated the American League. Helped integrate the American League in 1947, but they gave an update. Apparently, the, the there was a former player named George Elder who had a very short time in the majors, who was 101 and passed away, and left that left three alive. Uh, one is a player named Ed Mickelson, who is famous in Brownie War for being driving in the last run in 1953 before they moved. Baltimore. Yeah. Billy Hunter. I was at, at, uh, at the Seattle Convention, if I'm not mistaken, mm. uh, back in uh, 2006. Yeah, that was and I missed that one. Yeah. a wonderful presentation. And uh, they had the, uh, 
uh, Billy Hunter, the shortstop, uh, who they pay the for- Bill Vec paid a fortune for uh, to get from the Dodgers. Uh, for the 1953 season, he's 94. In fact, uh, Billy Hunter, uh, we had the 1982 Sabre Convention at uh, Towson State College where Billy Hunter was the athletic director, and he spoke. And the third one is Frank Saucier, who was an outfielder whose claim to fame is that he was the one that Eddie Gaydell pinch hit for yeah, he had a fantastic um, year in the minors one year. Yeah. Like way over 400. Uh, you know, he, went, he won whatever the minor league trophy was or cup was that, that season for the highest average in organized baseball. Uh, Flaché was, you know, really a promising player. And uh, I remember, I, I don't think I ever saw him play. He didn't uh, play very much. Yeah. Quite a few times. Well, he didn't play much, no. Yeah. Uh, but I did see the Browns on quite a number of occasions. And I saw Cocos. Uh, Cocos came up. He was Cleveland. I think it, I believe it was Cleveland property. He may tri- he may have been involved in the deal for Sam Zolbeck, uh early in the '48 season. And Cleveland was sorry to lose him, but they needed somebody. They needed, you know, they knew they needed another left hander in the bullpen and as a spot starter. So they gave up Cocos. And Cocos had a great rookie year. Failed off a bit in the sophomore year, but still was among the top five and. I think in the American League in home runs, and then something happened. He went uh, to the army. People, that's what happened. He went. At, well, even before he went in the army, he was no longer the same player. I, I really never met anyone or known anyone uh, who's had enough to say about him to um, explain why the why his drop off was so sudden. He uh, came back from he came back uh, from the army in time to play with the Orioles, but they. They didn't see what they wanted, and they released him very shortly after. He yeah, he was only playing on the fifty-three pound rounds. He missed fifty-one, and fifty-two. Yeah. Uh, in the army, and uh, recently I picked up uh, a reprint set of the fifty-two tops Browns, and then there were custom cards put out for a number of the players who didn't have cards in the set, and Cocos was one of them. So I had to get that, and. Uh, yeah, you because know, it was Roy Severs and Dick Cocos were the two big, and they 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 were on Redbacks in the '51 Tops set, and that's how I first learned about them. And then you know I collected the Bowmans that year. Uh, I found out more, and they basically, to me, were the antithesis of the Yankees. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I I checked their. Uh, season by season on reference uh, this morning. In the uh, 52 years of their existence, they had 12 seasons over 500, none after 1945. And they lost uh, over 100, I think it was uh, eight times. Were were they ever in the World Series? 1944. 1944, and all St. Louis World Series. Yeah, there was a... uh, we got guy, David. They 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 came close to winning it again in '45 with Pete Gray uh, playing, um, you know, at least half the time in the outfield. was couldn't really wasn't a good fielder, of course, with only one arm, and also was completely overpowered by any any pitcher who could throw more than 75 miles an hour or had any stuff at all. Uh, just didn't belong in the majors, even though he led the. Southern Association hitting in 1944. Um, I once spoke to a pitcher who faced him in 44, uh, a guy named Boyd Kepler, a name name you should know, many fans should know, but unfortunately he got injured in the 44 season. Uh, Would have been probably a very great pitcher with the Cubs. But Kepler said, you know, I had no trouble with with Gray. I knew he was going to either try to bunt or slap a hit down the third baseline, and I made it really hard for him. And I just threw, I just threw my hardest stuff. And he had trouble with it, but I don't know what. I, I have no way of finding what uh, Pete Gray, Gray batted against Kepler in '44, but or '45. And, uh, and then in '45, uh, I think he did like something like 218 with the Browns. Yeah, in 1992, the Sabre Convention was in St. Louis, and they had a Browns panel. And on the panel were Ned Garver, 
Jim Delsing, Don Lenhart. Uh, I don't remember whether or not Roy Sievers was there. Uh, mm. And the, the, they had a player named Babe Martin, who was a teammate of Gray in 1945. And Babe Martin blamed the Pete Gray for losing the pennant. He says, we all hated him. He was a very nasty person. Mm, and he yeah. didn't produce. But uh, there was a book uh, that came out a whole bunch of years ago by an author named William Mead called Even the Browns. It yeah. goes into the whole 19, you know, basically a uh, theme of uh, wartime baseball. I uh, George George Case probably would be very interested in this stuff. Uh, and uh, uh, but, Mead, Mead's book is a very good book, well worth yeah. reading by anybody who want, who was interested in baseball in that era. Yeah, and uh, so it basically centered around the 1944 Browns. And I also have another book that uh, came out years ago on the 1922 Browns who lost to the Yankees by one game. And that was the closest, uh, outside 1944, was the closest. And I think what happened with that franchise is that uh, they weren't very good in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, one of their players, in fact, David, you'll remember this, the first Hall of Fame, at the, the only Hall of Fame at the two home runs in a game for the Browns. Yeah, I, remember that. Yeah. I, I got that. Uh, no, I still don't know how yeah, I got that. Yeah, you did. Got, you stole. You stole the one right out of my yeah. right out of my mouth. You won yeah, the contest. Branch so. Ricky. <laughs> okay, Branch Ricky. But Branch yeah. Ricky. And Branch yeah. Ricky first, be, you know, got into the executive baseball executive business with the Browns. And then after the Federal League folded in 1915, the, a man named Phil Ball, who owned the St. Louis Federal League team, was allowed to buy the Browns. And he had a big fight with Ricky, and Ricky went across town, yeah, because the Cardinals were probably the worst team in the National League during the dead ball era. So Ricky went over to the Cardinals, and the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think but what Rick uh, did, if nothing else, built that farm system in St. Louis. But yeah, and, they would have done and, that for the Browns if they they would have they, they would have won them, but yeah, they they didn't. You know, they only didn't. So can you yeah. uh, can you guys tell me a little bit about George Sisler and yeah, um, I, I, and Brent I, Ricky? Yeah, I, uh, I I can talk about George. George look look at George Sisler's sister, lifetime record. Look at it, study it, and, and see if you can say that George Sisler was really among the top echelon of hitters in that era. Why and, doesn't and he, talking, why well, doesn't ob- he get credit? Why doesn't he get he, credit? He, he doesn't get credit for two reasons. One, he suffered, He had he had eye problems that was so serious he had to sit out the entire 23 season and after that he came back and he was just slightly above average for a few years and then he dropped below average for the remainder of his career uh, that, that's rating him among all first basemen active at that time and even before that if you look over his career this is a guy didn't walk a lot and did not score, and he's in, with, in a lineup that had a lot of good hitters, did not score a lot of runs. And it, 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 it really puzzled me. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know why. Certainly when he first came up in the, in the mid-teens, the Browns weren't that strong. But in 1922, they were a very good team and fell short at one position, uh, third base. Uh, Lee Fowler was the manager did not really like playing rookie players. And the uh, Browns had a rookie they uh, bought, I think, from Joplin, uh, in a minor league team at that time, who had a very good year in 1921, named, a guy named Gene Robertson, who later became a pretty decent third, base, third baseman in the American League. And Robertson pretty much rode the bench all year, while Fall uh, uh, played a guy named Frank Ellerby. And LRB never really hit much, was an average fielder at most, 
and uh, was in, already in the twilight of a very, very uh, unbecoming career in 1922 and didn't, didn't even finish the season at third base. But instead of giving, putting Robertson in right away and giving him a chance because he became a pretty solid first baseman as soon as, as, soon as he was I, you know, he had a fairly good season, 23, 24, 25. Then he kind of fell off the table a bit. But he played Ellerby, and then late in the season, when Washington put on waivers Eddie Foster, who was really at the tail end of his career, and a rather mediocre career at that. And Eller, or Paul picked, wanted to pick up Foster, and he picked up Foster, benched Ellerby, and played Foster down the stretch. And the Browns ended up losing, ended up losing by one game, and it really came down to a three-game series in St. Louis. Uh, toward the end of September. And the Browns, the, the Yankees came into town half a game ahead, and they went, they went out one and a half games in front. And after that, they, ne- they were never caught. The Browns finished the game behind. And, uh, you know, as you, can look at, you can look at those box scores and you cringe because the, the Browns lost two one-run games. And uh, you look at the w- way... Po- Full, full manipulated his pitching staff, and you can see why. Uh, Urban Shocker, who was his ace, uh, came on in relief in the ninth inning when the Yankees were down two to one, uh, two to one at the beginning of the frame in the top of the ninth. Started a rally, and he called on Shocker, and Shocker put got the first out. Uh, Dixie Davis, who had started, had already been replaced at the top of the, in the ninth, and then. Uh, Hub Pruitt, who has uh, killed Babe Ruth early in his career. Babe Ruth had something like 042 against him, and, uh, some ridiculous average. And but, um, Shock Pruitt didn't have it. Zace one batter, I think, or two batters. And then he called Shocker with Zace out of the bullpen. And Shocker got one man out and gave up a two run single. And the Browns ended up losing 3 2. And, and the Yankees left St. Louis ahead, one and a half games ahead. And they both played great ball after that, and the Browns just never ended up making that that um, that deficit up. They finished one game behind, and uh, they lost two out of three in that series, and that was pretty much it. And the yeah, Yankees didn't happened? have a really. What happened in part, in part was that Ruth Ruth and Musel didn't play a full season. Uh, they were suspended for a good part of the season, and. Uh, you know, the Browns had a, had a real chance. They had Ken Williams who led the league in home runs uh, once, once Ruth was not able to play a full season. And they had a very strong lineup elsewhere, every place at third base. And you often, you can wonder what, what would have happened if he played Gene Robertson down in, uh, the whole season because Robertson came out to be a pretty good ball player. Um, how did it come to be that the Cardinals dominated – Attendance-wise and well, when um, Rick, all that stuff. When Ricky moved, when, when Ricky moved from the Browns to the Cardinals, you know, he t- as I said before, the Cardinals were the worst team in the National League during the Dead Ball era. Uh, he, you know, they, the Cardinals were cash strapped, so Ricky built the farm system, uh, and it, you know they started to improve. And when they won everything in 1926. Yeah, you know, and the Browns were uh, going downhill. It was, uh, it was, uh, you know, it just turned. I mean, people if they could get a choice between two teams, and one is good and one isn't. You know, they're, they're going to go go to the one that's good. You know, except right. of course the you know the, the Phillies and the A's and the thir- you know in the late thirties and early forties when both of them were horrible, and the Cardinals just. You know, were either either one for the you know, for the rest of the time that Ricky was there, or were in contention. Very very few bad seasons. The Browns reached the point in nineteen thirty. I think it was nineteen thirty nine. Had a team that won forty three and was forty three and one hundred and eleven. They were truly terrible. And uh, nineteen thirty five, they. Reported attendance of eighty-one thousand for the year, and when we had we had one of the conventions in St. Louis, probably two thousand seven, 
I asked one of the native people whether there was a game by game attendance figure, and they said no. The guy said no. And uh, he said, I said, no. I said, no. I asked him, not even the sporting news. He said, no. So you figure, A, the team was terrible. B, it was during the Depression. C, there was no night or no night games. D, it was one of the hottest summers on record in St. Louis. So all, all the factors uh, came in. and uh, you know, But the Cardinals were, uh, were up there, and they just outdrew them. It's the same thing with the Red Sox and the Braves in Boston. The Braves were never, uh, you know, once the Red Sox uh, early in the 20th century and then after when they, the Red Sox started to become uh, decent uh, in the mid-30s, the Braves were always second fiddle. Good. Hey, uh, would you both be kind enough to tell me and the audience a little something about the genius of Branch Rickey that isn't commonly known. Start with you, David. Genius is not commonly known. <laughs> if you were a Pittsburgh fan, you were going to have trouble with that one. Uh, but if you were a Cardinals fan and didn't know that he ever went to Pittsburgh, <coughs> you'd find all kinds of things to rave about. A genius is not commonly, I don't know, it's known by certainly by uh, real baseball uh, historians and so forth, is his ability to trade a player still in his prime, but just a, a little bit over the peak of his prime, just passing the peak. Uh, the you know, classic case is Bucky Medwick. Uh, you know, Ricky knew when to get rid of him, um, and, uh, and he, he got rid of player after player the same way. He made some mistakes, I think. Um, you know, he had to find a place for Jackie Robinson to play, so he dealt, dealt off Eddie Stanky. Uh, Eddie Stanky proved to be a, a really good second baseman for years to come. But that was Robinson's position. He wasn't going to play shortstop. Reese was there. Uh, Billy Cox was, was all, in pretty solid at third base. Now, Billy Cox didn't Robinson get there really until 48. In yeah, four, in 48. And uh, Robinson played first base. Robert Robinson played first base in his first year. He did. And so and they, after forty-seven, they sold they sold Stanky to uh, the Braves, and then you know, he played on that the forty-eight Braves, and, the, and then the later the fifty-one Giants. And yeah. uh, Campy came up, and they had had to move Hodges to yeah. first, with, and it made sense. Uh, Jackie was too good an athlete. Just to play first. Yeah, and then um, when Gilliam came up, they wound up moving Jackie Robinson to left field. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's and why they sold Andy Tafco to Milwaukee. Right, which solidified Milwaukee. They had quite a platoon with Covington. And no, that was play. later. That was later. Oh, okay. But um, eventually, how about that? Yeah, the thing uh, the, the thing is with Ricky is that uh, the two things he, he most of the players hated him because uh, you know Sawyer once said he says he'll oh, go into the vault to get you a nickel change mm-hmm. and somebody uh, somebody one well, somebody else said this is he loved players and money he didn't like to see the two of them mix yeah <laughs> and the, at the Saber convention at Pittsburgh. Uh, apparently, all of Ricky's papers is, uh, are in the Library of Congress. So they had a, a curator that come, came up to Pittsburgh in 2018 for the convention and did a, did a, did a, did a whole thing. That, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, Ricky had Kiner because he felt that Kiner was basically a one two player. And, uh, and he, he hated Kiner because every time he would try to cut Kiner's salary, Kaya would go to the ownership who would restore it. Ah. Yeah. And, uh, and as we know, the general manager got a cut of the oh, yeah. So um, you hit Ricky in the pocketbook, that's going to tell. But, yeah, and, and uh, the, yeah, and one of the reasons that Robinson and uh, Walter O'Malley never got along was because O'Malley hated Ricky because Ricky 
uh, screw him out of a lot of money when he well, now he bought the controlling interest in the, the Dodgers. And, uh, you know, because he, he associated Robinson with Ricky. I mean, O'Malley went to the point that it says anybody, anybody who stayed with O'Malley after Ricky left for Pittsburgh mentioned the Ricky's name, he'd find him a couple of bucks. Uh, even talking about him. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. the thing is with uh, the Browns, uh, David can go into this one a little bit. They had a player in the 30s named Bo Bell who had a couple of sensational years and he fell, fell off the table very, very quickly. Yeah, he was with the Browns. I think he had 340 and 341 in successive years. I know he hit that 340 or better twice in a row. Yeah. And uh, an, a 340 average, always, you know, as a kid, well, I look and say, this guy must have been some player. What happened to him since he never did anything after that? Well, there were, there were a lot of guys in the, in the 30s like that that have a year or two really top-notch average and then fall off the table. They were playing with weak, weaker teams. No pressure on them to perform, and uh, you know they they and then they that some of them would get traded, and when they got traded, their uh, real colors as a player would show through that they really weren't they really weren't that sharp. Uh, sort of like Trout, no Tommy. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but the uh, you know the post the post World War Two Browns should never have been as bad as they were. Um, they just, they really didn't know, they, and Beck got, by the time Beck got the team, it, it was pretty well depleted. There wasn't much he could do. And he ended up, you know, with Hornsby, Hornsby managing the team for a while. And, uh, they, they got Jungle Jim to Rivera and Hornsby immediately said, proclaimed Rivera, the only guy in baseball today that I would pay to see play. And Rivera had been traded. Uh, within months, you know, for a very short time after that, for the White Sox, he proved to be a, a good player, a solid player, but uh, not not a historically great player by any means. And the Browns just didn't get the talent. They really, really had nobody. If they did get the talent, somebody would find a way to to uh, pilfer it from them. And, they didn't have uh, a Triple A farm team. Well, they had Double A in San Antonio. Yeah, they and, did. Yeah, and the, the story, which I don't know if yeah, they were supposed to move to L.A. after 1941. There was, I, I, I've heard that story. Yeah, yeah. and they were supposed to, uh, they were supposed to be approved on December 8, 1941. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> That's a little yeah. too much. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. you're right. They, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the Red Sox... Uh, in the late forties, Pilford Ellis, Kinder, and Vern Stevens from them, and Al Zarilla. Yeah. And the yeah. Yankee, y- y- Yankees uh, made some trade, but they, they had, you know, uh, they had the teams that were coming and going, basically. And poor Ned Garvin, Ned Garvin pitched in the major leagues for 14 years and never put, pitched for a team that finished above fifth place. No, no. no. And he's one, of, he's one of the last pitchers in the old 154 game schedule to win 20, 20 games for a last place team. And he's and, the only pitcher yeah. I think won 20 games for a team that lost over 100. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was a very good pitcher and, he, and a pretty good hitter. Yeah. He was a good yeah. player. Okay, guys, he, here it is. The most underrated player that you you guys ever saw. Saw it with you, Al. Underrated player on the Browns or under player in, underrated in general? Uh, just underrated in general. Underrated in general. Oh, that could be that I ever saw. That could be tough. You know, I have to say. I have to say, I think it's Vic Woods, of all the players I saw, and uh, what, what what people know about them today, uh, how they think of them, um, my, I, it's definitely Vic Woods for me. Woods had a terrific stroke, and I never I never seen a guy hit a ball harder. He hit a shot. I was at an Indians game 
sitting right behind the screen and Wurtz was at bat. I can't remember who was pitching for the Yankees. And Wurtz got a hold of him and it just shot like a rocket off his bat. And you he, he, he couldn't even see it in the air. It was a night game. And Mickey Mantle was in center field. And Mantle just took off running full, like Willie Mays in the 54 series. Took off running and somehow tracked that ball down. And I saw Wurtz hit a lot of balls like that. He, he made contact. He made contact. But he wasn't fast. He wasn't colorful. Uh, he never played for really, he, except for the 54 Indians. Uh, I don't think he was ever an pennant winner or even close. No. He also okay. has the record of uh, for uh, scoring the fewest runs in a season if any player drove in over 100. Yeah. Okay, Alan, Alan, pick a guy who you consider to be okay. underrated for whatever reason. Well, I agree with Dave. I love Vic Warts, but I'll give you two names. One is Del Ennis. Okay. Who was an RBI machine for the Phillies. Aside from one year, 1951, we had severe back problems. The guy was reliant you know, for the 11 years with the Phillies. I mean, he, he, they would boo him constantly because he was a native. And, uh, you know, he just, you look at his numbers, and they're very, very solid. Uh, you know, they dealt him to the Cardinals after 56. He had a big year in 57, then, you know, fell off the table, was out by 59. But I thought I thought the Phillies made a very big mistake when they retired his number number fourteen. And they did it for Bunning instead of Delanus, who contributed a lot more you know, to the Phillies than Bunning ever could ever hope to. And and I don't know about Ennis's I don't know about Ennis's politics, but they couldn't have been worse than Jim Bunning. I know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, and the other one I want to mention that just came up. Came up on uh, Facebook uh, today, <coughs> Carl Farrell. Ah, Scoon. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yeah okay, I, I, I like I like that one. I like that one a lot, and that's that's an excellent choice for to. Yeah, Farrell. Wow. Yeah, I I haven't thought about that in years, but he was underrated. Okay, well, before we close it out, i got to know from both of you, who is the most overrated player you ever saw? David. Uh, you know, because I hated the guy all my life, and I didn't see him, in his, I never saw him uh, have a big game against the Indians, uh, and I, 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 I think it's Joe DiMaggio. Wow. Yeah, no. yeah, I know he's an icon everywhere in the country, but I, I never liked the guy. Uh, I've got a, a, his, his autograph. He autographed something for me. Uh, I talked to him very briefly. I just there was just nothing likable about him, and I, I he was a he was a good good ball player, good center fielder on very good teams. Uh, but he just after he came back from you know after he came back from the war he really he had he had a couple of good years and a couple of in, you know semi injured years but he was not the same player and uh, Ted Williams to me was head and shoulders above him for you know all around play. Well, uh, turns out today I'm a good question asker. Um, what an answer. Um, Surprised me. I heard Alan go, "Wow!" And um, yeah, me too. That's well, uh, David's right. He was much better before uh, he went into the army for World War Two than he was when he came out. Okay. And uh, but uh, I was also thinking underrated Stan Musial. As crazy as that may sound, yeah, because he uh, he, he, he was just normal. He wasn't as you know, as volatile as uh, as. Uh, Ted Williams, and he wasn't as uh, off-putting as Joe DiMaggio. Because I remember when the, Ken Burns did that series, and they discussed the 1940s, the only three players that they discussed were Jackie Robinson, Ted Williams, and uh, and Joe DiMaggio. Stan Musial was an afterthought. Well, Stan Lewis was an afterthought for Ken Burns, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. 
But as far as uh, as far as overrated, you know, one of the things I, I I've, I've done a couple of times is this one site that deals with current I'm on that deals with current baseball. And a couple of years ago, I put down. You know, when talking about how fantastic my trap was, I said, you, I, I said, you come to me when he plays in games and means something. Yeah. Uh, with, that uh, team, with that team, it's never going to happen. But anyway, the one that I did, uh, and I created a firestorm when I did this, somebody a couple of years ago put up a picture of Nolan Ryan. And I was the first one to respond to it. I put down overrated and caps with an exclamation point. Okay. I thought that's who, who you named. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you why. Because when people look, most of these people look at my, Nolan Ryan, all they see are the no hitters and strikeouts. Okay, he did two things. First of all, he lost more games than any pitcher in the 20th century. That's His life he lost 292 games. His lifetime walk record will never be approached. Right. Okay. Yes. He never made any. T- he never came close to winning a Cy Young Award, and he pitched to the level of the teams he was on. He didn't make anybody better. He didn't no, wins, 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 wins is a statistic that uh, doesn't get published too much publicity called wins against teams. In his defense, I have to say, Ryan, I, I don't know about another guy who led the league in ERA with, it, with a 333 winning percentage. Uh, and he was on some bad, bad teams for a lot of his career. And uh, he'd been on, if he'd been, if he'd pitched his career in New York instead of where he did, for the teams he did, I, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I agree with Al and what a lot of Al is saying. Um, you know, in a big game, he would never be the guy I would call on. Uh, again, it meant kind of not trying to find somebody else on my staff. But um, I, there, there were a lot. There were there were. You know, he was he was fun to watch, and um, he did have some very strange seasons with bad teams, and it was hard. It sure was hard, 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 hard to hit, and you know, I. Um, but I think, you know, in all, Ryan is among 300-game winners. You look at it, his overall record, and you, he doesn't belong, and neither does neither did Don Sutton in, 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 in the same, same uh, vein. A lot of it has to do with longevity, though, and um, and the, the alleged steroidal thing. Um yeah. That's hard to speak to because who the hell knows, and who the hell knows about a lot of, a lot of players, and um, you could put an asterisk by the entire era, and uh, be well served. Hey guys, what a terrific podcast! I, I love having you back, David. I hope you guys will include uh, me in your future uh, shows. Um, I'd be honored. Uh, it's great, great being with you again, Ralph. Yeah, I had a great time. And uh, I want to especially thank David for coming on because when I called you, uh, David, when I called you this afternoon, I, I, it wasn't my wildest dreams that you'd be willing to do this or ready to do oh, this. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. When I heard what you what the topic was going to be and who, who who was going to be with me, there was no question I was going to do it. Um, yeah, you, well, you, let me great, say great this. Choice. You haven't lost a step, either of you, and I'm grateful. Uh, keep coming back. Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, the two mavens, David Nemec and Al Blumkin. I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link of it all, and... Um, We'll be back at you when we can. Stay healthy, everybody. Adios and happy trails. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. My pleasure. (laughs) Bye-bye. The proceeding has been a Comfortably Zoned Network production. 
You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.